office is always looking to resolve situations and solve problems and to help constituents. But this has been one file that has been very, very difficult, no matter which of the issues are that you have brought before me, as they relate particularly to the Native community. So we took the opportunity to invite you here for this meeting tonight. This is your meeting. It is not my meeting. It is your meeting. This is not a political party meeting. This is your meeting, and, and I can't say that enough. I'm very pleased to tell you that uh, Erda Walsh is represented by Laura Kirklope, uh, and I think that that is a very positive thing. We have invited all of the uh, elected officials, both from the Native and non-Native community, and I think that it's good that we come together and share ideas and express our, our concerns. And so I'd, I'd like you to pass on to Erda our, our thanks for your presence here. Also, we have with us from uh, Okanagan Chukwab, our MP, Daryl Stinson, who drove over with his wife, Sis, who is in the, in the back of the room. And I'm about to introduce Myron Thompson, who is going to be the chairman tonight. Uh, Myron has been involved in doing a number of these meetings and he'll be telling you where this will ultimately end up going to. Myron, unfortunately for Myron, I have to tell you that he was born in 1936. That was a long time ago, Myron. In Monta Vista, Colorado, he was raised on the family farm and resided there for 25 years. Served two years in the U.S. military. And then he ended up moving to Sundry, Alberta. He took education and was a teacher and a principal of a junior high and then a high school. He became a Canadian citizen in 1974 and has always been involved in his community in a very big way. Uh, he's presently the member of parliament for Wild Rose and is involved as our field person in the area of Aboriginal affairs uh, for our party as the official opposition in, in Her Majesty's official opposition in the Parliament of Canada. We're taking a very different approach to the whole issue and uh, we'll leave that to Myron and leave that to yourselves to define and determine exactly what I mean by taking a very different approach. Let me just say in concluding my re opening remarks, I recognize that for some of you in the Native community that coming here tonight, even being here tonight, is a major sacrifice for you. We do not take it lightly. We thank you. We thank you for coming and giving us the opportunity as the non-Native community to learn more about your concerns. And perhaps collectively, as we have just taken this issue of giving this a forum, giving this a starting point, perhaps collectively, uh, we will end up leaving here. I shouldn't say perhaps, we will end up leaving here far better for having shared our concerns and shared our ideas and working toward the goal of solutions to the problems that you are facing. But I really want to acknowledge those of you from uh, the uh, Danaka Kinbasket uh, nations. I, I, I want to acknowledge and underscore that I really do respect the fact that there is a price for you to pay for being here. We are very sensitive to that. So thank you very much for permitting me the opportunity to convene this meeting, and now we'll turn it over to Myron Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, and welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A special welcome to the Aboriginal community for coming tonight, and uh, to the other parties that are present tonight who are here with great interest and have concerns as well, I welcome you. Uh, everyone was given a backgrounder, I assume, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. It pretty well tells you uh, why, where we're at in terms of uh, what's been happening for the past two years. It all started in the Stony Reserve, uh, which is in my riding in Alberta, where about seven individuals, after a certain judge, uh, made some statements in the press uh, the Aboriginal grassroots people came to me and wanted to know what could I do to help them. Uh, we began talking at that time and I suggested to them that they, they needed to uh, come together themselves as a, as a people 
to speak with a voice on behalf of their concerns. And it led to a forming of a group called Kane, which is a committee uh, for a, a committee against injustices to natives, and led to uh, from that point to spread through Alberta, to where a number of reserves and a number of Aboriginal people were quite interested in what was happening and wished to participate. We called a meeting uh, last spring. Um, yes, in last spring of this year, in Airdrie, Alberta, we invited 31 people who had expressed some interest in this in this movement from the grassroots people. And uh, it was held in Airdrie, and approximately 180 people showed up during that day, during the whole day. So there was obviously some grave, grave concerns. We listened to the people throughout the entire day. We heard some, some very uh, tragic stories, to say the least. And uh, as a result of that, Cain grew larger, and we formed, they formed a group called Aboriginals for Accountability, AFA, to begin the summits following the Airdrie meeting. We've held a summit in Winnipeg, we've held one in Regina, we held another one in Alberta, and tomorrow, uh, this is the I believe it's the fourth one, or fifth one, I've lost track, uh, in a series of summits. And we're having one tomorrow in Edmonton. We expect a huge turnout there from the northern parts of Alberta. I want to make it perfectly clear so there's no confusion. This is not a political move. This is not a reform move. This move was spearheaded by the grassroots people. Uh, Mr. Stenson, Mr. Abbott, and myself are members of parliament. We are here to listen. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear what you have to say. As we go across the country and, and accumulate these summits, we will then seek solutions, resolutions to, uh, from the voice of the um, Aboriginal community, uh, from the grassroots, as to what they feel needs to happen. So each meeting, and this will be no different, will be opened to um, open discussion on any topic to start with. And at some point in the evening, I will call an end to that, and we will move into the resolution uh, area. This is people, what people believe we can do to solve the problems. And uh, I have three uh, resolutions that have been accepted to this point in time by the other uh, summits, and we're looking for more. So as when we complete the file of uh, the changes that the people feel need to be made, we will call a one-time Aboriginal grassroots national gathering somewhere probably in the western part of Alberta or the western part of Canada and uh, invite Aboriginal grassroots from all across the nation as I have personally now heard from people from coast to coast. Uh, from many, many reserves. We have also now are working in cooperation with existing accountability coalitions. I want to uh, extend my congratulations to two people. Rita Galloway from Saskatchewan, who has formed the Coalition for Accountability in Saskatchewan, has just done a tremendous job with the grassroots people in this area of accountability. And to Leona Freed from Manitoba, who likewise has a Coalition for Accountability and I want to make sure that we recognize them and their efforts that begin uh, in the case of a couple of them before Kane even came into existence. I congratulate them on their work and we're hoping that we cooperatively we can bring this National General Assembly together in the fall of next year, 99 or late summer, present the resolutions to be adopted by the grassroots people and then as members of parliament, we will be honored to deliver them to Ottawa, to the House of Commons, to ask for the things that you people uh, would want us to do. That's our mission. That's our involvement. Uh, we are pleased to facilitate these meetings on your behalf. And I am especially pleased with the, those members of parliament, such as Jim Abbott, who is willing to host this meeting tonight. So I thank him for 
getting the facility and making it possible for us to come together. Having said all that, I'm just last one last note. Our first flyer was printed. I hope that you picked one of these up. If you want extra to take with you, there's a lot of message in there. Uh, besides just the dates for the summit, because the last one's tomorrow that I have scheduled, there will be more summits coming up, as there's been a request from all parts of the country to hold more. The theme of our first was on the statement that was made by an elder from northern Alberta. I can't recall the reserve exactly. When there's nothing left to lose, we must speak out now together for fairness in our lives. Alone we suffer in silence. Together we can make things right. I thought those were great words coming from her, a mother who had lost four children to suicide because of drug addictions, alcohol abuse, and a few other problems on that particular reserve. A mother who had seen her husband die from tragic, a tragic death of violence. A mother who is crying out crying out for the blood of her children, saying, help us, please. That's what we're all about. I have invited every politician in the country. I don't care what party you belong to. I don't care what level of government, whether it be municipal, provincial, or federal. I have invited Phil Fontaine personally to these meetings. I've invited Jane Stewart personally to these meetings. I tell the people, you must hear you must listen to what the people are saying. We haven't had much luck at getting those people out. They're very much objective to, or objecting to these summits, but nevertheless, we're going to move forward because we feel that you must be able to express the freedom that you have, and that's the freedom to express yourself on your own behalf. So we're pleased to be able to do that tonight. I think what we'll do is start with a presentation from a person that's with us tonight who asked uh, that it be read on his behalf. He'd written it. I'll call on Jim to uh, take um, Conrad Clement's letter, letter. And would you read that to the public? And then after that's done, then we'll call for people to move to the microphone for any message they may want to deliver. A few years back, the band manager was caught double dipping into the travel account, billing the St. Mary's band for travel costs, then resubmitting the same amount to the Danuka Independent School System. When this was brought to the attention of the membership at a band meeting, questions were raised on the chief, to the chief of how much money, how long has this been going on, what action should be taken. The chief stated she did not have the amount available and the band had no funds to hire a lawyer to prosecute this individual. One council member stated that this was going back only one and a half years and was in the range of six to eight thousand dollars and there was the possibility of more as she had access to all the accounts of the St. Mary's band. At the next scheduled band meeting the issue was raised again and the chief was reluctant and very agitated to discuss the issue any further. To date she, the ex-band manager, made no attempt for restitution and the chief has made no attempt to reopen the case. My question is, why was this individual excluded from prosecution when two other people had committed a similar type of felony and they were taken to court and fully prosecuted? This seems to me to be an obstruction of justice. A new elected councillor's husband, who is non-native, participated in a program that was meant for band members to upgrade their education or skills. When this issue was raised at a band meeting, a lot of the band members felt it would be for membership only as this was the only chance to improve themselves. Following the next band meeting, the same councillor announced that from now on, spouses would be able to participate regardless of status. The membership never voted on her recommendation. This councillor is a member of many boards, and I suspect the only reason she participates is she collects honoraria beside full salary. If this is the case, why is her husband taking positions that should be for the younger generation that don't have any other opportunities? Since then, this councillor's spouse has participated in every program and employment opportunity that has arisen. She has used her position as councillor and many other positions she holds to gain opportunities in her favour. She is also director of treaty. To show another example of disregard for the rights of the disadvantaged, she unilaterally decided not to pay an individual the remaining $600 for contract work. 
She questioned the young person's participation, yet two other people that are full-time employees of both the Danaka Kinbasket Tribal Council and the Danaka Independent School System were paid in full. Bear in mind, how could they carry out their contract to the fullest when they were drawing wages for full-time employment? Where did they get the opportunity to complete their contract? This youth was, and still is to date, unemployed. Although the youth may not have been visible on site at all times, it was to the best of her knowledge she did fulfill her duties. I suspect the reason her work was questioned is she does not belong to those in power or the special elite group or have any connections with them. I feel this elite group can be very vindictive if things don't go their way or if you disagree with them. How would she, the director of treaty, question the $600 contract work when during the summer she and one of her staff arbitrarily decided to take their office staff on a 14-day camping trip into the provincial national park at the cost of several thousands of dollars plus their wages? This money that they extravagantly spent by selected few is borrowed money from the government for treaty purposes and not for the pleasure of a selected few. This loan must be paid back by the majority of the people who have no control over how the money is spent. In the past, when we've expressed our concerns about such issues as mentioned to the Department of Indian Affairs Canada, they have in turn forwarded documents to the Chief and Council and distanced themselves for resolving issues, more or less wiped their hands of their matter, so to speak. At one time, my understanding of the Dunnockin Basket Tribal Council was to serve the five bands in the Kootenai. Today, it is self-serving, hiring of relatives and friends. Take a walk through the main tribal office and see what you see. And what do you see? Non-native and Bill C-31s filling full-time positions. Writing this letter will undoubtedly jeopardize my wife and son's employment status with treaty. As I've indicated before, I feel these people are very vindictive. Harassment and violence would not be above them. Neither my wife or son were participants in this letter. I take full responsibility for the contents of this letter. There may be more irregularities that I'm not aware of, but these are a few. At one time, I used to attend band meetings, but now it's all a farce and a waste of time. Signed by Conrad Clement. Thank you, uh, Conrad, for your commitment to this cause and to your belief in it and to the courage that you have to come forward. Okay, the microphones are open now. I would ask uh, anyone who cares to move forward and uh, present uh, their case to do so at this time, and we'll open it up. Don't be bashful about being first. Somebody has to be first. Please uh, introduce yourself and where you're from and the way you go. Hi. My name is Xavier Eugene. I'm a member of the Trishwa Band at Invermere. I uh, had the opportunity to call on Mr. Abbott earlier this year in regards to, uh, to uh, formulating a petition in regards to uh, our, our suspicions of his management of money on our reserve. And uh, I don't know if we presented that, that petition somewhere, but uh, we have not heard uh, where, where it's at right now. And, uh, I have a prepared statement, but uh, there's a couple of things that I want to uh, say before I carry it on. Is that, you know, all the things that I have written down here, you may ask, well, why can't I get help, you know, from our, from our other leaders? We have an area council. Uh, we can approach them for, for assistance, but it doesn't do any good. They don't hold the purse strings. They'll just tell the other, the other leaders, you know, screw up. It's not your business. It's our business. It's our reserve. It's not your business. You don't, you don't pay any money. We get our money from the government. So that's, you know, that, so our other people, our other leaders can't help us. They know the situation we're in. And yet there's, there are powers to do so because they don't hold the purse strings. Only money talks in this form of Indian politics. Nothing goes to the grassroots level. Now I'll carry on with my, my written report here. Okay, uh, I already introduced myself. But most of the concerns I will be addressing are also concerns 
of my family and other band members who have concerns, but because of the possible repercussions, they are afraid to voice their opinions. <coughs> Some of our leaders have stated that, I, that they will not be attending this forum. Forum, That is their choice, and perhaps they feel they are serving their people well. I also would not be here if I were not frustrated to a point that I must air my feelings at a public forum, and that I would have been able to receive a listening ear from our elected band council on reserve. Lord knows I have tried time and time again to promote a working relationship with band council and the band members. I have received a listening ear from all preserved members who were responsive to some of the ideas that I presented, and most of the ones living off the reserve were the ones who signed a petition to have our reserves, reserves finances audited by the Department of Indian Affairs. In terms of trying to promote a working relationship with the band council, I drafted up a paper <coughs> outlining a formation of, of plans or working committees to work along with the band council so that our people would be involved in the development that has taken place on our reserve. This fell on deaf ears and methods were found to, defe to defeat this presentation. <coughs> I am up here because I have not been very successful in my endeavors to gain accountability from the present band council. I have requested information about where and how our capital and revenue from our reserve and monies received from, from the federal government are being spent. I've been trying since the early 1980s to obtain accountability of where our funds were and are being spent. I've never had a suitable reply from the band council. I have even gone to the channels of the Freedom of Information Act. I was successful in obtaining the information of what the band filed as a fiscal audit for the years 1982 through to 1993. When I received this information, I thought to myself that I would finally get some satisfying answers. I attempted to work with the criminal investigator branch out of Nelson. At first, when working with them, we thought we would, we, had, we would make good headway. We actually thought we might succeed. But as we went along, we found out that there were many blocks in our pathway. Primarily, these blocks were, were and are caused by the federal government's Department of Interest branches' antiquated policies regarding accountability of fiscal reporting. reporting. They require very little documentation to satisfy the band council's requirement as being accountable. There is really no mandate that the band council is required to be accountable to the grassroots member, members of their band. There is a little blurb in the Indian Act and generally band council can choose to ignore this and some do this and get away with it. The only prerequisite the Indian Affairs Band has is that they must satisfy them and not necessarily the band membership. The band council only audits what they choose to audit, and that seems to satisfy the government. There is no requirement that band council must have an, an audit review with the membership, and that ha and have the membership approve the expenditures. <coughs> in doing this, in in doing this, these, in doing exp expenditures in this fashion, it totally excludes the membership in having a voice in preparation of budgets, allocation of funds, education funding, housing, allotments, expenditures, etc. That gives the opportunity for the band council as just the band council to spend money any way they feel like it because band members have no say. It is my firm belief that the Department of the Interest must formulate more stringent guidelines to First Nations government so that it is mandatory to be accountable not only to the government but also to the grassroots people that the band council are supposed to be working for. In light of self-government possibly coming soon to First Nations communities, I believe that guidelines must be formulated to ensure total accountability. Uh, must also extend to First Nations people at the grassroots level, as well as to the federal government, as well as to the federal government. I believe that the First Nations leaders must be mandated to have these guidelines in place before they receive any form of self-government privileges. Earlier this year, some, of our, some concerned band members signed a petition requesting an investigation in how our funds were, were suspected of being mismanaged. This petition was submitted and we, have, we know that the Vancouver branch of DIA received it. To this date, we haven't received any news whether they were going to address this petition or not. It is our hope that someone will try and address the petition after this forum. We have also found in many complaints of the sales of sand and gravel and topsoil from our reserve lands without 
Planning Council have given us a report on how these revenues were received from these sales were being spent. We just received some good news and information regarding the sales of sand, gravel, or topsoil. We were informed that the Planning Council has no permit for these sales and that, they, that any of these products being moved out of reserve constitutes theft. We have also received information that any band member, whether they reside on or off the reserve, can file charges against the sellers or the buyers of these products. At least we have received some welcome news that in some ways we control our resources. <coughs> in closing, I sure hope some form of accountability that includes the grassroots people is forced on our elected band council, whether it is formed by our elected leaders who have good fiscal control or whether it is mandated by the federal government. In all sincerity, I would hope our own leaders would take the initiative to formulate good, honest fiscal controls for all First Nations people. I know that there are people here from other government agencies, and I hope that they give a listening ear and pressure the department to address some of the concerns I've presented. Thank you. In the House of Commons, on specific issues, such as mismanagement, the answer we always get back is, it's an internal matter. The chiefs and council must deal with it. So they are washing their hands of re trying to resolve anything. And uh, that doesn't solve much. So we understand what you're saying. Thank you very much. Next, please. I'd like to thank you before the party for hosting tonight's meeting and say that I feel it's long overdue. I am glad to see the Tobacco Plains people are here tonight. I'm glad to see everyone from other bands as well. Thank you for coming and sharing your experience and situation with If we work together, we can be a stronger voice than we can alone. My band has been in a very bad position, both financially and otherwise, for a long time. It was time I wanted to relinquish my birthrights and membership on my own reserve and apply for membership for myself and my family somewhere else. I was ashamed. I made an effort. I became chief for a brief while, made efforts to find out why things were the way they were and what could be done to change things. There was immediate resistance to change. I was all of a sudden no longer supported by other individuals who had begun the administration restructuring. I was left at home alone, holding the bag, so to speak. At a local level, I was not supported by tribal council, although some individuals did try to help me until their jobs came threatened by assisting me. I was not and I'm still not supported today by Indian Affairs. It is by court order only that we have made progress, the progress we have. I have been deceived by Indian Affairs over and over again. And I learned that if we want to change things, we are going to have to do it ourselves. <coughs> Everyone here wants change and honesty or we wouldn't be here today. Things didn't get the way they, they are overnight, and, and they're not going to get better overnight. By working together, instead of against each other, where dollars are so important, we can beat the corruption and bring back pride and integrity to our nation. Things get better. Don't give up. Thank you. here tonight that's always good to see at the meeting of this nature uh, young people please feel free to go to the microphone anytime you so desire as well not to suggest for a moment that either one of you two that just spoke were old but, <laughs> but uh, they, it's open to the, everybody so next speaker Myron I just had an idea if you feel a little intimidated standing in the middle with the mic if you want to come up here and use this microphone uh, please yeah. please feel free either either way either place if you're like a politician and you don't trust putting your back to somebody, come up here. <laughs> I'm Tony Pasco. I'm from the Shoe Shop Reserve. Um, I, I went on the Wraith Mayor program six months ago about accountability on reserves. And I still decided, you know, I made that decision that there should be accountability on reserves and less favoritism to 
people, as the, like in the elite group, and the chief and councils have their families for the elite group. We are told that being Aboriginal people, we have special rights, but I don't feel I have them rights. I think that it's time to get Indian Affairs to do, start to do their fiduciary obligation, which is to look after all Native people, not just chief and councils. The way I see it, Indian Affairs just calls Natives who raise such issues liars. They don't realize we are people who live with and witness our allegations. I'm not saying all bands are the same. If those that run legitimate operations should not feel threatened in any way, if anything, they should help us who are fighting to get the same kind of operation. I have been looking and asking for help for the past eight years, and I am very grateful to the people from the Reform Party who not only listened, but acted to get DIA to do something. I went to the NDP, Jim Doyle, to this day, uh, has done nothing. I asked, uh, I also took it to Mike DeJong, who sh showed no interest to straighten out these issues. I hope one day soon, all Native people can have the same benefits. I hope we can have our issues straightened out and see our children and great-grandchildren don't have to go through the same that we have. I feel the DIA is very much discriminating against people such as us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next two person. No one's moving too quickly. Jim, would you care to read the second letter that we have received? This was handwritten, and so I'm having a little difficulty with a couple of the words. You'll excuse me if I bounce around a bit. I, Doreen Alexander, felt hurt when I wanted to go to one of the Treaty Council meetings about a month and a half ago. It was held at Three Bar Range at that time, and another before that when it was at the Band Hall. Can't remember what the dates were at that time. When they told me I had to be on council before I attended the meetings, I felt I was pushed away from my own people. I called Audrey about it. I was pretty upset. I don't think it's right to turn your own people away when they are working for us. They told me I wasn't qualified enough for the position of attending. Considering I took treaty liaison training last year and got an A on my grades, uh, it was a six-week course. Thank you very much, Doreen Alexander. Okay, anyone else now would like to move to the mic? Good evening. My name is Marjorie Coleman. I'd like to thank the Reform Party for all their hard work in tonight's meeting and say that I, too, feel that it's long overdue. I live on the Tobacco Plains Reserve in Grasmere. My, form, my spouse is former Chief Wally Gravel. I'm not a band member and not a status Indian, but Wally is, and so are our two children. As you probably already know, the Tobacco Plains Reserve has been in trouble for quite some time. I've seen the mismanagement and dysfunction for myself, and so has anyone who has ever been there. The band receives funding from Indian Affairs, yet very little, if any, actually goes into the reserve itself or to the people. It always seems to disappear in that bottomless pit called administration, where nepotism rages and honesty, fairness and equality are forgotten. The same funding that enriches the lives of a fortunate few creates poverty, dependency and helplessness for the rest. Wally was nominated in 1996 to run for Tobacco Plains Council and accept accepted the nomination because of his frustration at the way things were being run financial position of the band and the overall lack of accountability by staff, chief and council, and band members alike. He won the election and was appointed chief. He is not a politician and he is not a businessman. Wally is a hard-working family man trying to honor his people by doing what is right and what is long overdue. In March of 97, with the assistance of Indian Affairs, a quorum of Tobacco Plains Council, not just Wally, had the office closed for reorganization and all staff were laid off. During the office reorganization and in the months prior to it, it became apparent that there had been many highly questionable and illegal activities taking place within the operations and administration of the band, 
including credit card fraud, check forgery, welfare fraud, suspected embezzlement, an almost quarter million dollar housing deficit, and unresolved logging issues. There were then, and are still now, people calling for accountability and receiving no satisfaction. In the first few weeks alone, the interim administrator found unopened mail a month old and hydro bills that hadn't been paid for a year. The computers were infected with the Boot 60 virus and had too many games loaded into them to be used for anything else. The financial record keeping was in severe disarray to the point that bank accounts had been garnished. More than 20 different bank accounts existed for the band. After paying a full-time bookkeeper $24,000 a year and a part-time bookkeeper $13,000, the band's yearly audit still cost $12,000 for an outside firm to prepare. It was painfully obvious that everybody had a job because they were related to somebody and nobody was actually qualified and nobody was doing their jobs. On July 9, 97, a few individuals who, in my own opinion, were not comfortable with the way things were gradually being uncovered demanded Wally's resignation. Upon his refusal, they staged an overthrow of the band office with the assistance of a delinquent family council member. They physically stormed the office, demanding the keys from staff and telling them they were to listen to them now. <clears throat> it was well planned and that there was no chief or council present and the interim administrator was out of the office for the day. They reopened the office and rehired the same family that wasn't doing their jobs in the first place. They ignored direct correspondence from Indian Affairs stating that Wally was still the chief. The delinquent councillor became the new self-proclaimed chief. What had begun as an office reorganization with the knowledge, cooperation and financial assistance of Indian Affairs became more of a struggle and battle with them. They immediately ceased cooperation when band members showed the slightest resistance to change. Not only did they refuse to deal with the problems, calling them internal issues, they resumed funding the illegal entity that, had now, that was now assuming control of the office and band affairs. The following months were very unpleasant with incidences escalating to verbal threats, physical violence, guns and the destruction of personal property. The RCMP were of no help. Evidence of fraud and forgery were turned into them, but it was no use. Still today, a year and a half later, we are waiting for a response and action to be taken. If there's such a thing as being directly ignored, we, re we experienced it with Indian Affairs. There were no help at all. After a lengthy year filled with varying degrees of nastiness, we had eventually landed in the Supreme Court of British Columbia, appearing twice on our own with no legal representation. Without band funds to spend on a lawyer, we are sure to lose our battle for Wally's reinstatement as chief and, ultimately, accountability. Then, through sheer good fortune, we found a legal voice and were finally able to see real results. By court order, all council members, including Wally, were suspended and a third-party administrator was hired through Indian Affairs. The idea being that an unbiased, neutral person would oversee the staff and conduct, conduct the daily business affairs of the band until such issues as membership and election regulations could be mediated and a new council could be voted in. Now, six months later, under the direction of this third party administrator, the band has seen no mediation, has no solid membership list, no election codes have been developed, the money for the third party agreement is nearly depleted, the band has run out of its, fa out of its capital funding, no jobs have been created, in fact, the office has been reduced from 40 hours a week to 12, the people hired are still unqualified for the positions and of the same family, Notices of meetings are still sent to a select few. Available jobs and housing opportunities are not posted. The very same people who were in power before are still in control, except now they speak through someone else. The majority of band members have no idea what is going on in the band. In six months, the third party administrator has yet to send a report or progress update of any kind to the band members, letting them know what has happened and what is in store for the band. We were promised financial accountability through the third party's management and this year's audit and we have yet to see either. Much to our horror and even amazement, Indian Affairs directly ignored our lawyer too. What finally lit the proverbial fire was a well-timed surprise meeting with our legal representative, an unsuspecting Indian Affairs employee, and a few concerned band members. Out of this rose the issues that had been there from the very beginning. Also from the discussion stem talk of the $23 million resort and eventually casino that we as a nation are supposed to be part of. Plans are in the final stages for this joint venture project, and the input of tobacco planes is critical for things to continue. The people of the band made it clear to Indian Affairs, the third party administrator and the other bands as well, that they will not be entering into any sort of agreement of that magnitude on the signature of a total stranger like a third party administrator or even a judge. The decisions must come from the people of tobacco planes and the signatures from its council. With the final stages of preparation for the joint venture projects quickly approaching, the pressure on the Tobacco Plains Band to solve its problems and come up with a council capable of doing business was mounting. That meant that the pressure was finally mounting on Indian Affairs too. 
It was not until the threat of having to blow tobacco plants part of a multi-million dollar deal became a reality that Indian Affairs finally sat up and took notice. It was no longer a little band with a hundred members or so angry with them. It was now the threat of the wrath of an entire nation that made them listen. Now, a representative from Indian Affairs who wouldn't get involved before has promised to take time out of his schedule to personally come out here and help solve the membership and election difficulties we are having. He's found 23 million reasons to get involved. Only after membership is settled will anything else be able to proceed. It's going to have to be settled by an outsider who has nothing to gain and nothing to lose by someone having membership or not. I do not believe that it is possible for the people of Tobacco Plains to decide it for themselves, and that is terrible. We are experiencing Indian against Indian, a division created by the Indian Act, Bill C-31, and the Almighty Dollar. People who were born band members are no longer, while whites and others who have married in now receive full status, membership, and funding. I have seen membership lists with anywhere from 80 to 140 people on it, depending on who wrote it. How can Indian Affairs continue to pump money to a band when funding is dependent on headcount and neither the band nor Indian Affairs knows how many members it has, yet the money comes in? I sat back and watched the mismanagement and dysfunction long enough. I watched them humiliate and degrade Wally when he was right and was the only person with enough backbone to stand up for what he believed in. Almost every person on that reserve has complained in my presence of one or more of the operating policies of their band and the way that, that things are. But when it came to the crunch and when it came to saying it out loud, Wally stood alone. So I have supported him and stood by him. We have our allies and well-wishers. We have people who are tired of hearing it and say to forget it and drop it. Well, I'm not forgetting anything because there's going to be something left for my kids and their heritage and the way things were going, that was not going to be possible. After hitting brick walls with Indian Affairs over and over again and having no success elsewhere, I became very vocal and public with the problems we were experiencing. I contacted Jim Abbott's office and found an ear who would listen. I am very happy to see that many of you have chosen the same path. There were many times when I felt like the little red hen baking the bread. Over the last year, my family has endured a great deal. My car was scratched all the way around it, ruining the paint. Individuals approached my four-year-old daughter regarding court documents. There was personal trash put on the community bulletin board at the store about me. We have had hang-up phone calls in the middle of the night for a year. The list goes on, but we never gave up once. And that's part of the reason why we're all here tonight, because we don't want to give up. We want to change. We all want change, and we all want fairness and equality for all members of the Tanaka Nation. Hopefully, with the support the Reform Party is giving us and the interest they are showing in the accountability of Indian Affairs, we can see some results. In closing, I would like to thank all of you for coming tonight and sharing your views with everyone. I would finally like to say hello to those of you that I have yapped endlessly to on the phone and have never met. Hello to you, and don't give up your fight. Things will get better. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very well done. And I, uh, I would suggest, if it's possible, can to get a copy of, uh, as he's made that, I'd like to have a copy, if I may, uh, to add to our files. And I also want to point out, uh, I have uh, at the front desk by the door uh, lots of business cards of mine. If you're interested in, in becoming part of AFA, there's no cost or anything. It's just a matter of being a contact person to keep information as to where we're going and how we're advancing as we move to other parts of the country. And if you'd like to be on the mailing list and be part of it, please leave your name or, or just pick up a card and it has my address on there. Uh, send me a piece of mail. Remember, it doesn't take a postage stamp. It's just send it or drop it off at uh, Mr. Abbott's office at any rate so we can put you on our list of contacts. We now have several hundred, if not thousands, of people who are on the list, and we're growing daily, and so we'd like you to be part of it if you are not at this time. All right, next speaker. Okay, Jim, I'll have you read another one. This one is from Rob Louie, who is uh, from the Lower Kootenai Indian Band. I would have been here tonight, but I don't have the money to return back from Vancouver. However, I would like to thank Mr. Abbott for recognizing this issue, an important one for all First Nations, and for agreeing to read out my comments. First of all, first of all I am not shocked and disgusted that Ms. Pierre said she did not want to show up. 
Sadly, I sh knew she would not have the guts to hear the concerns of her people. As for Miss Tanise, she mentions that the Reform Party should have had the courtesy to talk to KKTC about tonight. In talking about courtesy, where was the courtesy when the Chiefs decided to take treaty money from the Treaty Council when Treaty Council did not want that to happen and use it for debts of the controversial St. Eugene Mission Resort? Tonight is not about reform versus the Danaka Nation. It is about Danaka citizens having their voices heard about the way the so-called leaders are managing the nation. I hope people will take their fingers out of their ears and point to the problems that need fixing. As well, I have to make some people understand that there is a huge difference between keeping information internal and making serious problems known. A person cannot keep something internal or secret if it is criminal in nature, such as misappropriation or sexual harassment. If so, they run the risk of some criminal liability, like aiding and abetting, and they too become suspect. Also, if concerns are not being addressed, like not even returning telephone calls when someone has a concern, then there is no other option but to go out and exercise one's charter right to express themselves. With that being understood, I would like to draw your attention to what I feel needs to be done up front to fix the problem at hand. The first thing that needs to be done is for the leaders to stop denying and ducking the problem. Then there needs to be house cleaning. By house cleaning, I mean people working in band offices have to stop covering up fiscal problems and also start treating people fairly in spite of personal differences. This, no doubt, will take some courage. There exists a plethora of problems within the band offices, especially regards to financial funds. Some people working in band offices seem to think they can do what they want regardless of consequences and feelings. They usually get away with spending money how they want because of their clout and connections. They are also sometimes protected by political correctness. The people who suffer are grassroots natives living on and off reserve. It appears some band office employees sometimes label a person on first impression or rumors. They then make a decision based on that. There are some people employed in band offices who lack the skill and educate, education to execute their jobs, and this is scary. It is apprehensive because if there is a major devolution of governmental responsibility, how are band offices going to handle it? Hire more non-natives? If that is the case, then self-government has not been achieved because we are not doing it ourselves. It will be a replay of how it is today. In parting with my comments, I would like to direct attention to the Globe and Mail's front page news of October the 24th, 1998. It was reported that the Samson Cree Reserve is fraught with financial disparities and zero accountability. There is a tiny group of leaders harboring millions of dollars that are supposed to be for the benefit of the entire band members. This tiny group, furthermore, makes huge amounts of money for their wallets as they make decisions that control the lives of the whole reserve community. But this problem that exists on, in the Samson Cree Reserve is not new to the Aboriginal world. It exists in a majority of bands across Canada. I have been in three eminent post-secondary institutions, the College of the Rockies, University of Victoria, and University of British Columbia. Aboriginal people from different First Nations from across Canada attend these institutes. I have discussed the problem of lack of accountability, embezzlement, mismanagement, and misappropriation of band councils and tribal councils. All the Aboriginal students could identify with it for it existed where they came from, and they knew of other bands facing the same problem. They would point to examples when it happened, but nothing was done about it. So it was not surprising that it was reported in the newspaper First Perspective when the question came back, do you trust your chief and council? The poll showed a powerful no, 77.3%. 77.3% said no, while a mere 13.6% said yes. I wouldn't be surprised if the yes people were band councils themselves. <laughs> I would like to conclude by making this point too. Chiefs and councillors like to say that the status quo is unacceptable and it has to change. When they make this point, it is in reference to native people vis-a-vis -vis federal and provincial governments. True. But it is also true that the status quo within a band is also unacceptable and this too has to change. 
getting rid of the people that are in conflicts of interest, harboring money, and making uninformed decisions that affect the lives of a First Nation is the kind of change that is urgently needed. The chasm that exists between the haves and the have-nots in band and tribal council is a problem that will not be going away without public and political pressure from native and non-native alike. I think it's uh, fair to say that we all share in the belief that a government, be it native or non-native, should be accountable to those it represents. Voicing your concern will help change this salient problem facing First Nation communities. Thank you. That was Rob Louis. All right. Anyone else? To discover if I could go in there and make it look like something after I was done. But when I got back, I went to the guy that was in charge. He was from, uh, forget, phase construction from out of West Vancouver. And uh, I went to him. His name was uh, Mr. Thompson. I asked him, I says, I finished school. Uh, what's the chance of getting back to work? He says, yeah, we don't want you here. You know, we don't need you. Get in line like everybody else. And that's when my battle, battle began. And I had a meeting with uh, the chief uh, and him. There was three of us in, a, in that room. And, and the air was pretty thick in there. You could feel, feel what was going on in that place. And uh, you know, the thing that really bothered me was, was when that man said, he pointed at me and he said, he said, this man here will never make it in the real world, you know. And, and I was disgusted. I, I asked him to stop the meeting, please, so I could leave, you know. And the chief sat there and listened to what that man had to say, you know. That is, you know. I said, come on, say something, please, you know, in my mind, you know. Because I was in total shock, and I still feel that way sometimes. Why she just sat there and never said nothing for me. Now you understand why. You know, I'm, I'm, I just want to bring that to your attention. Because this to me is, you know, I, you know, I, 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 did, I did what I had to, to get where I am today. You know, and, and if there was young people here, this is what I'm trying to explain to them, express to them. You gotta keep doing what you're doing, no matter what gets in your way. Just go, 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 don't stop. And that's and that's and that's the way I feel. I, you know, I, I can't stop. I just gotta keep doing what I'm doing. I, what was my hobby? What was my hobby is now my job. I have to go outside and do work for myself. You know, and I try to start a business. And nobody will look at me. They just laugh. Ha ha ha. Take my take my uh, invoice and. Give it to somebody else. Give it to your friends. But I was never aware of that. You know, all these things that happened, and I, you know, I'm disgusted with it. You know, I hope I hope some, you know, I like to thank this gentleman here for, you know, I I I was I was telling my friend there, uh, I don't like fighting on a full stomach. I thought this was going to be a war in here, but thanks to Mr. Thompson here, I'm. I can, you know, really have somebody to talk to now. You know, thank you very much. No, thank you. I might uh, tell you of a couple of experiences that I had. Daryl Stenson, uh, the other MP, and I visited Winnipeg. Uh, I'll tell you a fear that we we see on the horizon. In Winnipeg, there's a fellow by the name of Mike Calder, and he works with a rehabilitation center, particularly with young, young people that are on the streets of Winnipeg. Winnipeg is becoming a renowned place for in Indian gangs, severe, serious gangs. Uh, the latest gang is a gang of youth called the Deuces. We're in charge, and, and uh, I forget their ages are under 19, aren't they? Yeah. No. A huge membership in charge of prostitution, in charge of drug enforcement, and they're vicious. 
they are extremely vicious. And when people like Mike Calder manages to get to some of these, and we met some that came out of those gangs, they're saying things like, where could, where could we turn? We had nowhere to go. And in the gangs, they were welcomed. And they received money. And they received attention. Uh, the level of severity of these gangs, so to give you an example, how many have heard of the, of the uh, Hells Angels? Pretty severe group. Four of them went into Winnipeg. They decided it would be an ideal city to go to work. All four ended up dead at the hands of the gangs that already are there. So the Hells Angels have stayed away from there. But the big fear I have is when, you, when I was a prison critic of, of the prisons before I got into Indian Affairs, I've gone to the, uh, re the uh, penitentiary in Manitoba, both the provincial and the um, uh, federal. I've also been in the prisons across Saskatchewan. And folks, they're full of young native people. There's something wrong. You know, when, what is it, about 6% of the population of Canada is occupying 50% of the cell space? And it's leaking out of cities. Like, this is the big fear. Now it's creeping out of the cities. It's entering into all areas, this gang movement. To me, that's frightening. And the reason they're doing it, the biggest reason given to Mike Calder was always, and correct me if I'm wrong, Darrell, but you were there, where else could I turn? You know, and that frightens me. And I think it's a real cause for concern. Anyone else? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Zoe Renz, and I'm a teacher and education coordinator at the First Nations High School. And I'd just like to begin by saying I don't know really exactly um, who my boss is in light of what we call taking responsibility. And so when I <coughs> think about what I'm supposed to do as an educator, one thing we always talk about is uh, criteria. And for those of you who aren't familiar, with that term, what that means is we all get our funding for our programs or our grant money and then we go and we spend it and then we say we're responsible enough to be able to handle that because we've met the criteria. And usually that criteria means you have to do something like fill out a report once a year, maybe twice a year, send it into the government or into your boss if you're lucky enough to know who that is. And then guess what? Next year, they'll give you more money. So it's my belief and my philosophy that not only do we have to ask for accountability and responsibility from the administrative level, but it goes right on down through to the people that are actually putting forth the programs that the administration is getting the funding for. And then we have to take a step further and look at the criteria and maybe look at changing that. Because in my opinion, if I'm hired as a teacher and I'm out there delivering a program and Department of Indian Affairs or whatever agency or business has supplied me with money to do that, it's not good enough for me to say, well, yeah, I filled out my report twice this year and I hope I get my job back next year and there's funding available. I'd really expect it to be a lot more. So yes, I agree with everyone here tonight in saying that we have to change things so that people are made responsible, but we also have to look at the criteria we're using to set up those responsibility factors. So I wish you all luck. I don't know if I'll be here again next year, but I'll keep my ear tuned to all the progress you're making. The meeting is scheduled to end at 9, however, uh, I do hope that we can end the meeting officially. 
So those of you who do not know each other can spend a few moments getting to know each other and, and uh, getting acquainted. It's called, uh, it's part of coming together. So what I want to do now is move to uh, the solutions. We've heard a lot of the problems tonight and we're going to hear more. I, uh, I want you to know that I am, I am one who initially and now it's got to the point where I don't think, think it's necessary, but initially I visited some of the reserves that were in the original summits and I went into the homes of grassroots natives and I am terribly, terribly disappointed to report that third world conditions actually exist on many reserves. I was uh, graciously hosted by an elderly lady who was 86 years old. I took my wife with me. We sat on a plank with, set up on tree stumps. That was her furniture. In a home that had no electricity, that had no running water, had children running all over the place who were sleeping in broken down buses, trying to make a life. But what a gracious host she was. She poured her coffee. We met all the members of the family. We moved to other parts of the reserve. We saw uh, temporary shacks. They were trying, they were quite frightened about how they were going to exist through the winter. That's in Alberta. I went to other reserves and so with my wife. I always feel safer when I travel with her because she's tougher than I am. Uh, it's unbelievable that living in what has been declared the greatest nation in which to live by the United Nations, that we have so many people living in such conditions. And as a politician uh, from Ottawa who has the power to do something about it, I apologize to you on behalf of all the last, the politicians you've had over the last few years for allowing it to get that bad. And I dedicate to you my promise to do everything I can, and I know my colleagues will back me, in changing that situation. We're dedicated to that. Now some people will say that's nothing but political maneuver. If they would have seen what I saw, they would see humanity suffering. And any person in their right mind would not allow their friend or neighbor to live in those kind of conditions. We understand many of the problems. They're different in all reserves, but some of the things I've seen is absolutely a shame. And we are dedicated to do something about it. And we need your help. And that's why you must stay involved. Without you, it's no good. So I thank you for your courage to come forward and speak at the microphone and tell us your story. Now I want to move into the next part of our thing. I have three resolutions that have been adopted by the other summits. I will read these resolutions to you. And uh, yes. I'm sorry, Absolutely. Good evening, my name is Lorna Tate. I'm from Matakakoop First Nation in Saskatchewan. I've recently moved into BC in 1994, the spring of 1994. One of my concerns living in the nation is that for another First Nation, living in the nation, <laughs> I guess so to speak, is that um, I recently made a trip back home and I was brought up to date with our um, situation on our reserve in South Saskatchewan also. And it's, it has obtained uh, self-governance also at its own level, at its own uh, reserve level. Since it's obtained self-governance, our reserve has no accountability also for um, funding for the distribution of funds to the membership also. So I came, came back to BC feeling really uh, 
really left out and really um, alone because for the people that are supposed to be uh, receiving money and for us to be su receiving support from our, our uh, reserve once in or out of, out of the province, the support just wasn't there. So now I'm living in BC here and I have a son, he's 20 years old and um, I often wonder, well, where do we go to, <laughs> you know? We're not, uh, we're not financially supported by the nation because we're not members of the nation. We can't go to our ba own bands because they, they played around with the funds so much also that we don't have accountability there either. Then we're told that we can go into the city and we can apply to other, other agencies like in the, for school, for health, for whatever the case may be. But then we're told, well, write to your band, They're, they'll help you. So we're put into a vicious, vicious circle. And I've had the opportunity to work within the Tanaha Nation. And I found that uh, the lady there, Doreen, like, you know, I've, I've, I've supported her in many of her uh, end of ours that she's set out before herself. And I came in as a support person working in the, in the human service area. And I found it very difficult because I found that wherever the people needed support, the support only went so far and that there was no follow-up for them. And it was always left up to that individual to go out and, and see or do what they can for themselves. I know that um, I've talked to a lot of people that would have liked to have come here, but with all the publicity and with all the, um, a word that's often used is fear mongering. It works from both sides. And that's why I feel that the room hadn't been filled with the First Nations people. And I also find too that I was born Métis, married into a Cree. <laughs> and I find that as soon as I say, well, you know, I hear people talking about the Métis and I think, hmm, I wonder, should I tell them that I'm Métis or what? Like, you know, and I finally really realized that, well, why not, you know? And I think, well, just to keep my status for my job report, that if I reveal it, then possibly that those job opportunities <laughs> won't be there anymore because of the political things behind all of that. So I guess what I want to say is that um, this, vi this cycle, I've, I've been taught when I was 17 that it's up to us individuals to break that cycle. And if we continue to live in that cycle, then that cycle is going to keep going to our kids, to our grandchildren, and to generations to come. And when you have the opportunity to break that cycle, that there are people out there like these people here, like the people in the room that are willing to support each other in uh, whatever they set out to do. So I'm fumbling for words now, but I just wanted to make that clear that, uh, that it's happening everywhere. And until uh, people come together like with in forums like this and feel the necessary uh, tactics to, to put together that it might not come into play now, but it will in the future. And it will really put a bug into the people that are holding others back in succeeding from whatever level they're at. So and I'd just like to acknowledge Wally here also. I'm residing on the Tobacco Plains Reserve and I've seen and I've heard and I've witnessed a lot of uh, misdoings also. And for me to be able to draw conclusions onto them, I, I know it's a responsibility of mine, but in order to uh, do that, you have to go through uh, the system. And in order to keep my rapport with the people, I uh, support them in a silent uh, manner, like Marge understands that, I think. <laughs> but she knows that uh, 
there's only so so much that a person can do and a per so much a person can say and um, and I believe in their fight and what they were doing and I continue to support them also so I just want to thank you for being here also well thank you very much I might uh, give you one more incident of uh, in my experience in this business in that one particular reserve, uh, some people phoned me, some grassroots people managed to get their hands on some documents. And they wanted to show me these documents because they felt that they, that it was evidence that uh, should be, the charges should be laid against uh, the, against somebody. So I went and I looked at the documents and what it was was a list on a sheet of paper from the social welfare department of the reserve of payments and where they were going. And there would be one person listed, maybe $450, and then another one, 280 another one, 375 quite a list. Then all of a sudden, there'd be one for 9500 And then there'd be another $150 here and 200 and then another one for about $7,500. Then you look at the next month, and it'd be the same thing, except there that one person once again in the area of eight to nine thousand dollars and then down here was the other person in the same area and i said well what does that mean like you have this list why are these two people getting so much money and that's when they smiled and they reached in and then pulled out the other documents that went along with this that they wanted me to see what they showed me was two documents death certificates for both of those individuals who had been dead for over 13 years but the checks were made out in their name. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, you know. I mean, paying checks to dead people, there's something wrong. Wouldn't you suspect that there might be something wrong? So we went to the RCMP, and the RCMP said, agreed that this maybe should be seriously looked at. And when you go to the RCMP, all the affairs dealing on the reserves goes to commercial crime. Commercial crime then investigates. Two months after the investigation, Commercial Crime reported back to these two individuals there would be no charges or, or no further action due to lack of evidence. Now, I can imagine all kinds of reasons for that kind of some, that something happening. I wouldn't dare suggest for a moment what, what I think happened. But I believe that there's something going on in Ottawa. You have one department who's supposed to be in charge of investigating something, and you have another department who doesn't want that investigation because they believe these are handled, should be handled internally. Guess what department that is? Indian Affairs. Uh, you know, and, and it, you know, is somebody being told to back away? I don't know. I wouldn't dare suggest that would be what happened. But to me, there's something wrong, so. Uh, one thing we're doing, Mike Scott, the official uh, deputy or the official critic for Indian Affairs, and I are meeting with the commissioner of the RCMP very soon, and uh, we will be including uh, Mr. Abbott, who is in charge of the Solicitor General, who's in charge of the RCMP, and we want to know where do these requests for investigations, where do they go? Why isn't there follow-up? What's happening? Uh, there's something really wrong with the picture. Uh, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but it sure looks suspicious to me. And it calls for an investigation, and I think something could be done. So we're going to be doing that on behalf of uh, you people who are the ones who pay the price for loss of funds or whatever the case might be. I'm going to make your MP work again and ask him to read an initial letter uh, to from... Um, Sharon Willington, who uh, lives on a reserve, and uh, that will open up the session on resolutions. Acknowledge, understanding, and respect are words which continue to come to mind at this time when there is a strong feeling these three aspects of relationship building are missing in the lives of both Native and non-Native people. My own personal association with people of the Danaka Kinbasket Nation dates back to 1989, and since this time I have observed and participated with people of this nation in their effort to be acknowledged. 
Much has been accomplished, but has the acknowledgement been fully satisfied? And if not, what is needed to complete this before stepping on? If one step is not complete, how can the next step be satisfactorily taken without serious consequence to the vulnerable? If there is lack of communication, how can one be understood? If there is lack of leadership, how can direction be taken or given? If there is no communication or leadership, then there is no direction. Within native culture, leadership is responsible to take direction from the people. The people guide the leadership, not the leadership guiding solo and in isolation of their people. This is respect. The ills which beset the native people day today did not occur in four, eight, or twelve years, but over many years and decades. Acknowledgement, understanding, and respect of this by non-native people require the appropriate and necessary time needed to correct the inappropriate actions of the past. Not in a few years, but in the time which is needed for native people to become whole again. This means governments must maintain their agreements of responsibility until the wholeness is complete. What is occurring today is governments rapidly abandoning their responsibilities to native people before self-government has been determined, leaving people to exist in a state of no man's land where there is lack of law or the existence of law is used at random. This state of affairs only contributes to the further destruction of native communities by creating adversaries and contentious behavior among the people themselves. It is my hope the leaders of all involved will take this time to return to the people, to listen to what the people have to say, and then acknowledge, understand, and act in a respectful manner in the needs of their people and all people involved so true peace can be achieved through truth and protect the future generations of all. And that was from Sherry, Sharon Wellington Letter. Well, thank you. Those are excellent points of, that we can keep in mind as we move forward with trying to resolve the issues. Uh, that we need a, a good understanding and acknowledgement, I think, has come a long ways. And uh, communication is something that all of these things come from, so it's important that we keep in touch with each other. Uh, it, now is the time for band members to put aside any differences they may have and reach out for the common goal, the common good of all. And I encourage you people to make, it ha make that happen. The three uh, resolutions that have been adopted, now I should say adopted at the summit, which means the previous summits like these three and want them to move forward. Um, the National Assembly, the huge one that we're planning for 1999 is where all resolutions will be adopted officially so as we can take them to Ottawa. Now the first one came from the Coalition for Accountability from Manitoba under Leona Freed. And I, uh, on her behalf, before AFA became into effect, on her behalf, I am preparing a private member's bill and it will be introduced into Parliament probably next week or possibly the week after, depending on how long it takes them to get it ready. And here's the way it's going to read. Uh, the private member's bill will be an act to establish the office of a First Nation Ombudsman to investigate complaints relating to administrative and communication problems between members of the First Nation communities and their First Nation and the First Nations and allegations of improper financial administration between members of First Nation communities and their First Nation and between First Nations. Uh, that's been approved by all the summits uh, to this point in time. Uh, I will be introducing it as a private member's bill. Uh, if you have any discussion at this time, I would ask you to move to the microphone if you have any questions about that particular um, the resolution or have any comments that you'd like to make about it, please uh, do so at this time. We'll make like an auction going once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, private members' bills are introduced, and then you really hope it be, gets to become a votable motion. Uh, if that's if it becomes a votable one, then you can have a pretty pretty good. It could have some clout because that forces every member in the house to stand and vote for or against that resolution. Oh no, all I would be able to do, all I'd be able to do at this time is introduce it. And then I have to wait until my name is drawn from a hat. That's the democratic process we use in Ottawa. If you're name, lucky enough to have your name pulled out, then you get to, to take your bill to, to Parliament for second and third reading. Oh no. To, to give you a realistic idea, 2% of private members' bills actually get passed. So let's quantify it, but yeah. it doesn't mean that we should stop trying. No, we're going to continue to try, and what I'm saying is that is an act that will be produced, and once it's introduced, then I would encourage all grassroots people through the AFA or whatever who believe in that sincerely, that they would form uh, together and get petitions from as many grassroots people as they can and send them to my office so as we can table them to support the bill. Uh, that's just more clout. We operate rather strangely, the reform guys like Jim and I and Daryl. Uh, you're, you're supposed to do everything in a polite manner, you know. But when somebody gives me something to give to Jane Stewart, I go across the hall and I put a stick in her face. <laughs> this is for you, ma'am. Now read it. You know, we don't send it through the mail because it usually gets lost. We had a question, I believe, over somewhere. I'm just concerned, uh, maybe you can enlighten me on the subject, uh, where would this ombudsman come from? Would he be just an appointee or uh, would he be elected? Then he would have any credit and still fulfill his job. There are a lot of questions that need to be asked about that, and the uh, uh, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal people have gone through hundreds of questions about that in their discussions. They want to know who's he going to be. Is he going to be an Aboriginal person? Is he going to be appointed by the Minister of Department of Indian Affairs or the Prime Minister of Canada? Is he going to be some, someone that we'll have the opportunity to, to elect? You know. Now, all of the whenever you whenever you pass a piece of legislation such as this nature, what follows that then is the regulations on how you how you develop that particular office. So all of those things will be up for debate once you get it into legislation that that's what's going to happen, that you're going to establish an office of the First Nation Ombudsman. It's much like the gun bill that came down recently. You know, the gun bill itself was this thick, the regulations are this thick, you know, following it. So uh, it, it would be premature now to discuss where it would come from. But the principle of a First Nations Ombudsman to investigate these complaints and, and issues uh, is the intent of the legislation. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could put the word an independent in, before the word ombudsman. Of an independent ombudsman? That, of course, that could be an amendment to the that could be an amendment to the uh, to the um, resolution. However, sir, you wouldn't be able to present it. <laughs> but if I, yeah, of course, I realize that. I that was just a little joke between you and me. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, one thing I, I, I mean, uh, could you go to the microphone just in case somebody has a problem? Oh, I see who's got the problem. No, <laughs> I got the problem. Uh, one thing I see about it is, it's, uh, like say for the, uh, for the common layman, it's so long-winded. You know, like, I mean, you, you go right through it there, there's, it, you know, it, you can mix it up in between there. The investigation of things that is administrative communication problems between members of First Nations mm -hmm. communities, and then they just carry on through there. You know, it's, it's so long-winded that uh, the layman has a hard time understanding it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when they, you present these bills, you give them the idea and they come in the legal form that is required by Parliament, 
Uh, I hope someday that will all change. If the reform ever gets to be the government, I can promise you, you'll even be able to read the Income Tax Act. <laughs> <laughs> Someday will come when it will be in layman's terms. It's it's pretty bad. Every piece of legislation that comes in, it takes you know you and 15 lawyers to determine what it says. And that's that's life. Of course, our income tax. You know, one of these days we won't have to have anybody interpret that. We'll just get a sheet of paper and it'll say up here how much did you earn, and down here it'll say send it in. <laughs> be a simple form. Okay, any, or, any other discussion from anybody? Okay, I'm gonna call for a vote uh, from the Aboriginal people, please. All those in favor of adopting resolution number one, please show us by raising your hands. I'm gonna ask you to stand if you're in favor of it. If you support resolution one, will please stand. Yeah, no, it's, uh, the, the, it's there should be a sheet. Yeah, the first resolution. Okay. Jim, if you take a quick count, or Daryl, you guys should do something at this meeting. Okay. Okay, you may be seated. All those that oppose this first resolution. All right. That's unanimous. Uh, some people didn't vote, I hope. I hope it's not because you didn't understand this bill. If it is, I encourage you to talk with any one of us uh, further about it to make sure you do understand what it does mean. <clears throat> the second resolution that's been accepted at the other uh, uh, summits that we have had states that the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada have authority over any Indian government elections, referendum initiatives, or community approval processes to ensure that they are fair and lawful. Okay, discussion on that one. Pro or con? Boy, people in Cranbrook are really easy to get along with. This one was beat around the wall for two hours in Winnipeg. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did everybody hear that? All right. Any further discussion on that uh, statement? Yes, uh, Conrad. I'm going to ask you to go to the mic because it's really... Conrad was going to come, but you come first and he can get out through that chair. Uh, one of the things that, uh, um, in regarding elections, there, uh, especially those that are still compelled or not able to get off of the... Indian Act uh, format is that uh, Act is so antiquated that it is fair to the uh, to band members who cannot reside on reserves because of lack of housing. Many people want to vote, but uh, they can't vote because they, they, in order to vote under the uh, Elections Act, uh, as, as uh, presented by Indian Affairs, that if you do not reside on reserves, you cannot vote in, in the, in the uh, in a band council election, and that that uh, law is so antiquated because uh, most reserves cannot have housing for their off reserve members, or they refuse to hand them housing through some form or other. I believe that that thing should be reformed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's strange, you know, all across the country, I found that there's different rules for different bands. Uh, in one particular reserve, they just had an election on the Cody Reserve. And people came from all over Canada to vote in it as they were declared members of the band. You know, and uh, you go to another place, and anybody that lived off the reserve in another election I'm aware of, 
not one person who is a member of the band who's living off the reserve could vote. Uh, one particular election, uh, it was observed that there were supporters for a certain individual passing out $100 bills. Now, there's lots of things going on that just aren't right. The purpose of this resolution is they feel that if you have the chief electoral officer of Canada to have authority over it and then to rule it as, a, as, do, as we do in all elections, that that's the only way it's going to be fair and lawful. Yes, uh, Conrad. Yeah, it should be explained that most of the people that are elected as chief and council don't have any special skills at all. They're elected because of the popularity. And there should be something in here that they do have management skill or some special skill before they can work uh, uh, as an um, administrator or, or band. Could you, uh, would you be willing to present that as a, an additional resolution? Yes, I would. All right. Uh, I think if I could get Jim or yeah, or somebody who's got some skills of writing, I can just stand and hang on to this thing until I can write. <coughs> now, we'll get to terminology for that, but it's my understanding, see if I have it clear, that uh, in order to run in the election for any reserve, you must have some skills or other qualifications yes, that, skill that, or, are, yeah. that prove you to be capable of performing the duties. Yeah, and be well aware of the Charter of Rights and um, labor laws, everything like that, but they should be well aware of that and stuff. And use the powers that we do now. Okay. Uh, a lot of I'll take that as an additional resolution that you would like to have discussed at the National Assembly. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the input. Um, yeah, I know at the back of the plane it's been dis discussed a few times that perhaps when someone wants to run for chief or council that they do it the same as any other political race, they do it on a campaign basis, where they can tell their people what they think they can do for their reserve and for their band and for their people, instead of just whoever has the biggest family wins. <laughs> so true. Or the most money sometimes ever. Yeah. Uh, another thing that's been suggested, uh, regarding elections, uh, a lot of people find it amazing that Canada spends millions and millions of dollars to go to places like Brazil, Haiti, you name it, to observe the elections to make sure they're democratic. Mm -hmm. When we're in our own backyard, we have many that are not. So uh, we feel maybe we need some kind of a process in place to observe these elections to, to make certain that they are fair. And that's what this particular resolution would create. Under the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada, he would have the authority to appoint Put them in place to make sure the election was fair and lawful. But you couldn't negate the results of the election. Well, I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I, what the, to what extent his powers are, but I think that any uh, charge against uh, an illegal election or an unfair election must be brought to his attention and it must be investigated and if there's grounds uh, for that then uh, certainly uh, an election be, can be approved uh, show, if it can be shown to be invalid. I can see the value of this but I'm I'm not made it but I, it just seems to me that this is right back to <coughs> the EIA. Well there would be a public notice for one thing and there would be secret ballot <coughs> There are lots of things that would have to happen that don't presently happen. That's for sure. Well, I mean, I don't know if I agree with it at all, but I, I, all it bothers me is that I have authority over any Indian government election. It seems to me the, the people, the First Nations people should have. That, I'm worried that it's... It's Big Brother again, paternalistic. It's this is a, this is a resolution that came from the grassroots people. Oh. These are not resolutions that came from anyone but grassroots. Keep that in mind. There's no resolutions brought forward by any politician or any white person. These are okay. resolutions from the grassroots people and other subs. There is uh, I will not put forward on their behalf without their approval. Understand. Question back there. I was just wondering, like, um, I think there should be a grace period in there 
where they can check out the qualifications before they are elected. And of course, I don't believe there are qualifications in place, so uh, I know. Conrad's uh, attempt yeah. is, is well taken. Okay. And if they feel that the grassroots people feel that uh, should be the case, then that should happen. Jim, you have comment? Well, I'm just going to cite as an example some of the question that there's been about the NISCA referendum. Uh, the question that there has been is that the people who were supervising the NISCA referendum were the proponents of the NISCA treaty. Mm -hmm. And those same people were making the judgment as to who was going to be qualified to vote. Mm -hmm. And those same people were the people who counted the ballots and told us that it was whatever it was, 62% approved. I think that what this, the purpose of this, is exactly to get away from that, of saying if you have a process, then there would be a properly authorized uh, list of voters that would be agreed to. And those voters would not be able to be intimidated any more than you and I could be intimidated when we go to cast our ballot in a federal, provincial, or municipal election. And thirdly, that the results would be done uh, with scrutineers. In other words, it, this would be the regular election election process to get away from, from the question marks that there are even today about the NISCA agreement. Any other further debate on uh, resolution number two? Okay. Like in Canada, we can uh, absentee vote if we're away from our particular area election time. I'm wondering how um, that would have, this type of thing would affect, even if there is a voters list, people that are maybe residing on one reserve but members of another, and if they're voting on an issue of, of funding that would directly affect them, where is the um, accountability going to lay? In, in that to ensure that they have the opportunity to say and, and vote on whatever the issue is and then they um, get the results of that. See, all, all of that work is prepared by the chief electoral officer well in advance of any referendum that involves more than one nation or one uh, band or one reserve. Uh, that work is done prior to getting the voters list. It's much like the VLT vote. You heard of the VLT vote in Alberta? Uh, many people were angry because a town and the people that lived in town got to vote whether they stayed or went. Well, a lot of rural people were mad because they as well play these things and they should have had the right. And so they're considered, now it's in the courts. And those, those particular elections and those particular votes will probably be thrown out because it did not apply to all the people who use them. And uh, I think the electoral officer has to make certain that the voters list complies with who it applies to. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but I think they do a pretty good job and if they're trained in it, and uh, I think they would come up with, you know, well in advance, they'd go to work on preparing a voters list through their process and I think it could be done. Okay, no further discussion then. I'm going to ask for a straw. Oh, here we go. See, I uh, get managed to get those hands up. I was just going to ask, uh, if these are passed, how are they going to be brought into the community and the area? Because uh, I know, like, uh, when you mentioned the NISCA, it's like it's a It would, you know, in the sense that, uh, uh, like it states quite loud and clear, that they would have authority over any Indian government election. Any? Any. Because right now I know that when uh, the Basque Plains has their uh, elections and the voting to actually take place that there is an electoral officer. But that, is that not appointed by the, uh, by the people that's in power? I'm not sure who he's appointed by, but... You see, the, elect the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada is a nationwide position. Oh. That office exists already. Okay. And would be that uh, it would be extended to him. Yes, uh, Conrad. I think the uh, election, 
because the department of repairs could not in repairs uh, select the electoral officer. If there are the bad custom regulations, the chief and council will collect their electoral officer. That, of course, this legislation will eliminate both problems. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good morning. Well, there, uh, we're talking about funding again. The Fox is bringing this point up. If a person is off the reserve, they're still using his name. Getting funding, right? They're, they're getting funding for that person on the reserve. But what about the person that's off the reserve? Uh, wouldn't that go the same with the voting? I would think that uh, if you are a member of the band, that would give you voting privileges. Whether you're on or off the reserve. for those choices and decisions and we change that. We also change that all the people that live off of the reserve have the opportunity to vote and this caused a really big conflict within our community because of the fact some of them said, well, I don't want to vote. You know, you haven't talked to me for ages. You know, why do you want me to vote now? Well, what happened in the community is we took it upon ourselves to say, you know, the only time we recognize these people is when, when they come back in a coffin and we say, oh yeah, that's our member. <laughs> but the point was that, that even though that you're not residing on it, we felt that it was still important for you to know what's going on in your community and that you have a right to vote on it. You don't have the right to hold chief or council positions because you're not there, but you do have the right to vote on, on uh, matters within the community and things like that. And that was passed, I think that was passed a couple years ago, we did that, because our 16-year-olds now within our community can vote. And we may we pass that thing in one of our meetings. And I don't know the, the information should have been handed out to you because that was one of the things that was discussed there. It should have been handed. So. Tony? Yeah, we are, like on our reserve, we're not, we're still on the Indian Act and we have, we tried to go with the custom election, but they shut that down. It has to pass the chief account of it. Of course, if an election is held and under the control of the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada, uh, that would come out of a different budget vote that wouldn't have to do. On your last comment there, when you said it was uh, banned funds that wouldn't be paying for that, it's actually not banned funds anyway. It's taxpayer dollars that's really paying for wow. whatever's going yeah, on. Sometimes we overlook that, but most yeah. things are paid by taxpayers. Even this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the fiscal responsibility resolution is a little complicated. The vote is very slow. And if you have any questions about it, I hope I can answer. That the usefulness of trust funds be reviewed as a means of improving compliance in the financial agreements between Indian governments and Diad toward the goals of ensuring equal opportunities for all members of all reserves, eliminating on-reserve poverty and creating greater economic self-reliance. We want to make sure that money that is supposed to get to all members of the community actually gets there and is accounted for. Uh, we've discussed this with the legal beagles once again and in this terminology, that's exactly what it's designed to do, to make sure that money supposed to get, that is supposed to get to all members of the community actually gets there and is accounted for. The wording, once again, is, I'm like this guy, yeah, I think we're too old to understand this kind of terminology. The old layman language is what I like. And, 
Uh, if we can get reform to be the government, that's what will happen, that they will come. So any discussion on that particular uh, resolution? Please uh, feel free to have your say. Going once. Going twice. And here he comes. <laughs> and I'm not really old. <laughs> I know. I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't make that. I told just, you that. I already told you once tonight you worked. So. Okay. One of the things in here that, okay, it always refers basically to our, our leaders. There's nothing in there where the grassroots people have any say. I mean, they the leaders make the decisions. And there's nothing in there that they must have an audit review approved by the band membership so that they can be involved in planning for the future. And this is where the fight is always, where the uh, Indian Affairs passes off the buck and says, okay, it's an internal matter. If it's an internal matter, why, not, why, don't, why do not the local grassroots level people have a say in, in regards to approving the audit that, the, the, that their leaders have put forth to satisfy the government? This is where I'm coming from, and this is the reason why I'm here. This is the reason why I've been fighting for the last, last few years to try and get some accountability for the grassroots people. Every decision that is made is made by our elected leaders who have the power uh, of their families to back them up to become elected. There's nothing that, to, that uh, makes available to the off reserve members that uh, the monies that their, their revenues that are coming off the reserves are being accounted for in a fair manner. They have no say on their only, only thing that the federal government will listen to is what our leaders put forth as an audit. It is not approved 90% of the time by, or even especially in our reserve, none of the time by a, a band review audit so that the, they, they, they can be questioned on why this money was spent and how it was spent, who it was spent on. That's why I'm here tonight. This line of crocker that it's only the leaders that are, that are accountable at the federal government and they are accountable under the federal government, not to the, the grassroots level, that's a line of crock. Okay, um, that the usefulness of trust funds be reviewed as a means of improving compliance, meaning that the financial agreements that are made, that the Indian government and Diane must comply. They must comply with the rules to assure that money gets to where it's supposed to go. Now, once again, as with the first resolution, the principle of this, which is to make sure money gets to where it's supposed to go, can be accomplished once you put the regulations into place. And the regulations very likely could say uh, the compliance requirement will be, will be uh, put in place by the grassroots people. You will say what the compliance requirements are. But first of all, they don't even exist. You know, we have to remember they don't even exist. The purpose of this resolution is to get them into the legislation to say there now. All other legislation put aside. This says that you must comply in the financial agreements that take place. Now, who would think so? Could be a lot of changes in the wording. These aren't, these aren't not the final product. The first one is. It's already done by the experts, and that's what it had to be in order to get presented. These others will be a long time before they'll be presented. And I take your notes to what you have said, and I agree with you, by the way, 100%. I'm sure a lot of the other people do. And uh, maybe we could reword that to where it would uh, bring that message out more clearly. And we'll certainly look into that before we move to the National Assembly. Okay. Okay, ladies first. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cecilia Tunis from the Shishaw Band. Um, this last one about this uh, number three one here, uh, the wording that says, equal opportunities for all members of reserves. Um, to 
me that just again refers to those members that are living on reserve. Um, I don't live on reserve. Uh, not to my own choosing, but um, I got a cold, so everything comes up when it comes up. Uh, could I interrupt you at this time and ask you if you would be willing to move an amendment to this resolution? To where you could say after equal opportunities for all members both on and off the reserve at those work would that uh, would that satisfy your concern on that yes because i think um some band members uh, chose to live on the reserve <coughs> because of the employment opportunities and education opportunities but i know that when i was going to school um, i only got one phone call from the band office regarding my son um, when they wanted to do their own um, education, independent education. And I had asked um, the person who phoned me, um, what would we get out of it? Because we're off reserve. And this was the only time she ever took the opportunity to pick up the phone and phone me. And so it's like, you know, a lot of things can happen for band members on reserve because the funding is there for the members on reserve. But, you know, like for myself, I see I have two boys and one of them is in high school in town here. What are the opportunities if I move back to the reserve when I know there's more opportunities here in Cranbrook or in a larger community? So to me, it's like, um, you know, like, do we have to live off the reserve and not benefit from these? You know, whatever the ban. I think that's a good, good point. Uh, could we give you your name once more? Um, Cecilia Tanese. You got that, yeah? Yeah, okay. So we'll, we'll ask for a seconder to this amendment. It's been suggested that we amend this resolution uh, to read after members of reserves should be eliminated and there should be members of the reserve just members both on and off. Members both on and off the reserve. <coughs> Would uh, one of the Aboriginal, Aboriginal community care to second that? Tony? Okay. Uh, all those, well, I'll ask, is any more discussion on that amendment? Do you agree? If so, it was signified by rising. Are we going to have a second reading on this? There's probably a lot of people that well, these are resolutions that were going to take to that National Assembly in 1999. And we're going to try and encourage everybody that we could possibly get there to get there. And I would assume not, you know, a whole reserve couldn't go. But they can certainly, through the grassroots, people can pick delegates to go on their behalf to wherever it is to represent that reserve. Well, that has yet to be determined. My guess would probably be Calgary or Regina or Winnipeg. How's that for a guess? <laughs> Uh, I have uh, more discussion on the amendment. No. Okay. If there's no more discussion on the amendment, we'll just do it by raising hands. How many of you favor that amendment? Raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Okay, that's carried. So that will be amended as you suggested. And thank you for that. And now, more discussion on the amended resolution. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know, uh, in regards to what George was asking, if uh, there's going to be a follow-up meeting in regards to any of the issues that others may have, <coughs> and now that the initial step has taken place, and possibly a good, um, good okay. comments made about it. Like, I'd like to know uh, more about these people here in this brochure, this uh, Ross Sheehoof and Roy Middlechief, and. Jim Horseman, if they would be more, uh, 
willing to come down and possibly talk to Because uh, the meeting in Edmonton tomorrow starts at 8 in the morning, mm -hmm. they couldn't come tonight, or they didn't have been here. So I told them I would come and have the list meeting tonight, okay. and they're going to start the one in Edmonton tomorrow. But uh, here's what I encourage you to do. You have my business card, and if you wish to become a participant in AFA, contact my office and tell them who you are. Will you fear trouble? <laughs> Pardon? Will you fear trouble? <laughs> well, <laughs> Come here, can we, how can we get to that where we have no the, the, If you wish to have another meeting in this writing, you need to just contact Mr. Abbott. But I want, if you want it to be on behalf of AFA, then contact my office and we in Ottawa will also participate in organizing it and getting it set up. And I would look for someone to host it. Uh, no, who knows, maybe he's got lots of money, he can do it more than once. Uh, that's a question, you know, that I have to unfortunately say to people when it comes to funding for gas or whatever, uh, no, it isn't there. Yeah. You know, that is something we have to work on uh, as a group of people who are fighting for a cause. And if, um, if we wanted to attend uh, some of these uh, things that are going on, uh, will we be able to get a pamphlet from you stating when these things were happening? Because, Absolutely. Because there is not uh, that uh, coming from, you do send brochures out to the bands, but we never get it. We'd be very yeah, What, what we help. need is a contact person. That's why I need you to, like Conrad has given me his name, the address, phone number. More of you need to do the same if you want to be part of this. And then what happens is all brochures and everything will go to your hands. Mm -hmm. And then you and you and your committee and your own reserve, it's up to you to get, a, get this information spread around. Okay, thank you. Okay, we need volunteer helpers out there in the communities. It's just like the three fellows that uh, we've contracted for a short time, they're finished on the 15th of December. They helped us initiate the movement by making contact with their own people. They're all grassroots neighbors. Uh, we won't be able to necessarily continue down that path unless I'm able to find more dollars to support someone who can move across the country to visit reserves and deliver messages and take messages. But that's all in the plans for next year. We'll, we'll see where we go with phase two. We, we're just about finished with phase one. Then we go into phase two in January. We'll finish that in March, and then we begin the committee work on organizing a national grassroots assembly. And then we really need you people to help us get people there. And the other thing I might add, and now is a good time to do it, I hope you take a lot of these brochures, not just for the meeting sake, the meetings are done when they're here. But it says here, if you would like to donate to AFA, please make our make out a check payable to Alan Warnock in trust and mail it to that address which is my office in Airdrie, Alberta. And if you go out to the community and seek funds raising, that's going to be held in trust for the National Assembly in 1999. Darrell. Yeah, I, it's, uh, on that uh, donations, Myron, you do not have to be uh, an aid in order to donate to that. Yeah, all you, all you other folks here, you're welcome to donate to that as well. <laughs> I have already, and uh, I've started the interest account. And we're anticipating there are a lot of people who are concerned about the conditions, the living conditions on the reserve. We're looking for money to come in. We're also anticipating that the Aboriginal people will support it. And I, you know, and there's even good reserves. Like we shouldn't be too hard on the. There are people who are running good establishments, and they're they're behind us because they want other people to across the nation to run, you know, in a fashion that uh, they feel they should. So we're asking them to participate with us. But you should take some of these pamphlets for information. And if you don't, keep that address because if anybody would like to support this cause. We need the money to start coming in. I don't know what it would cost to hold a National Assembly, but it would be a few thousand dollars, I would think, but not a great amount. And what we will do is we will build an assembly based on the amount of money we, we, we receive. Then each community is going to have to figure out who they're going to send there, how they're going to get there. 
uh, it, it's not going to be an easy task because I know a lot of these people can't even afford to leave their backyard. But uh, it's amazing how many have managed to get to many of these summits. Some came from way far north in Alberta, made it to Alberta. Eight, nine people in a car. I don't know how they did it. And then they asked for help to get gas money to go back home. And donations from the crowd itself came in and I'd give them a hand to get back home. It's desperate out there for many of them. I understand that. If we move into an area of trying to get funding for everything you know possible, it just wouldn't work. But if we get donations to start coming in now, made out to this person, that will get the ball rolling. <coughs> and we're anticipating it's going to be a good, re good, good return on that. It's going to come from grassroots. That's what built the Reform Party, is grassroots. I think that's what's going to pull you people up, the grassroots. It's not going to be any political party. It's going to be the people. You're going to do it. I know you are. Now back to this resolution. Any further discussion? Going once, twice, third. Uh, supporting the resolution as amended, please raise your hand. o'clock in the morning, so uh, to get to that meeting, and we'll be there all day. If any of you want to drive to Edmonton tonight, <laughs> give me a call, I might ride with you. Uh, I thank you, Conrad, for coming up with an idea for a new re resolution. We won't spend any more time tonight discussing that, but I encourage you that if you have some ideas, talk to each other. Anything you come up with, let us know. Let's get this together. And I trust and I believe that with the guidance of God that there's going to be some great things happen on behalf of grassroots people of uh, these nations. And it's going to be because you make it happen. Thanks again for having me. And I'll ask Jim to dismiss the meeting. One of the things that I really appreciate about Myron is that he comes across very gruffly, but I think that you have seen that the size of this man he is this size because of the size of his heart. Uh, and uh, he really... And lots of ice cream. <laughs> he, really, he really has uh, the welfare, the well-being, and the future of Canada's First Nations at heart. And uh, I thank him so much. The travel that he does is just absolutely unbelievable. Uh, if you can imagine, he's going to be on the plane at 6.40, over to Calgary, off the plane, onto another plane up to Edmonton, and straight into a conference until whatever the heck time it is that it says that, it's, that that's going to be over. Be turning around, will you be going to Ottawa or home? Uh, back to Ottawa. Back to Ottawa. I mean, th this guy is just absolutely tireless, and he's doing it. He is doing it because of his belief that there is a better, brighter future, and together we can pull it together. Again, I thank all of you, all of our Native friends. Uh, I know that for many of you that this is a night that is going to cost you. I know that. I, I have never sat in your seat, and so I don't know what that means to you, but I have a sense of what it means to you. You have made a great sacrifice by coming here and participating. I encourage you, as Myron has suggested, to get involved uh, with the movement. Make it your movement. Make it your vehicle. Because, as I say, together we can do it better. Again, thank you, Daryl, for uh, coming and, and joining us as well. And yeah. uh, Make no mistake about it, folks. The Department of Indian Affairs, Phil Fontaine and his organization, most chiefs and councils will make every effort they can to shut us down. Make no mistake about that. 
So uh, on behalf of Daryl and Jim and I, I thank you for your courage. And I pray for your continued courage. That's what's going to make it happen. Good. So with that, thank you very much. Good night. Okay. Your name is? My name is Xavier Eugene. I'm a member of the uh, Shishop Indian Band in Invermere. And how did you find the conference today here? It, uh, I uh, expected more of our people to be here, but um, as the, our other political leader said, they uh, figured this was a, uh, a uh, witch hunt. Probably scared most of our other people away. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, this conference will will create some kind of a kind of action from the comments that have been given and the uh, the uh, speakers who pre uh, who presented their concerns. I'm hoping something does come out of it. And, and how's your opinion on what happened today? Uh, it's. Hopeful, you know, I grasp the straws, uh, any straw, like I've been fighting this uh, battle with, uh, to gain accountability for, for our people for the last, you know, 18 years. And uh, we've tried many avenues. And uh, like earlier this year, we used, uh, we invited Mr. Abbott down to, to uh, our little golf course in to have a meeting to express our concerns, and we had a number of our members come down, not only my family, but a few of our members, and he gave us advice on uh, ways to try and gain accountability, and one of these was to get a petition going with enough signatures in there to qualify to send it to Ottawa. We uh, attained our, our goal uh, in, in people who signed the petition, we gained enough signatures so that we were eligible to send it to uh, to uh, our, to the finance people in Ottawa to, to the Reform Party to present. And as far as I know, I had a report just the last couple of days that uh, the Department of Indian Affairs has also received that petition. And I asked them what has been happening with it, and they said uh, they don't know yet. How many signatures were on the petition? I roughly, I'd say about 50 to 60 members uh, signed it. Out of, what's the whole membership? Uh, it's a little under 300, but then that's including uh, uh, family, you know, families and you know, children and and uh, parents. So uh, roughly, I don't know how many families I would be. I never really uh, keep track of it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. for tonight's uh, conference? Uh, my name is Jim Abbott. I'm member of Parliament for Kootenai Columbia, which is this constituency. And uh, it was my office that convened this meeting. How did you find the turnout and the outcome? Well, the turnout, of course, was only 40 people. And, uh, of course, we would like to have had more. But the quality of the discussion, the quality of the input, and the sincerity of the people that came was just really, really heartwarming as far as I was concerned. I think that we ended up accomplishing something positive because we ended up going, going over three resolutions that will be able to assist the Aboriginal people in Canada to be able to move forward and to build a better future for themselves. And you also accomplished a new resolution or brought into effect. How do you find it? Well, I'm a little concerned. The, the one resolution that was proposed was that anybody running had to hit a particular high bar, a particular, a particular point. I'm a little concerned about that because then you would have people judging what that high, high bar was. 
but this is an Aboriginal meeting, and uh, if within their culture uh, they could achieve that and it would be workable for them, I'm not Aboriginal, so who am I to say that it's not workable within their culture? And what about the one about the natives that are off the reservation and want to vote concerning the reservation? Well, I think in the same way that the NISCA agreement, when they did the referendum vote for the NISCA agreement, they did exactly that. They had voting off the reserve and on the reserve. And I don't see any reason why that can't be done. If the resolution that was passed tonight sees the light of day at the national conference that says that the vote would be done by people uh, under the chief electoral officer, I'm sure that they would be able to find a way to get an authentic list and also be able to verify who the people are that were voting. I think that that would be positive. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you.